So um, uh, I have a separate, completely unrelated thing I wanted to mention first. Uh, I mentioned this to a couple of guys after services last week, but I thought it was, uh, maybe it's like that kid who can't draw, who's so proud of his drawing. But anyway, I had a thought for the first time last week and I wanted to share it. And it was directly related to something Ben had said in his message about remember the Sabbath day. And I had not ever thought of it this way. And you might can look up the linguistics and prove me completely wrong. That it's got no basis whatsoever, but I just thought I'd share it as a, as a thought. But so the other commandments are literally impossible to forget. I mean, I guess you could, but and, and you're not going to forget to not hurt somebody, steal, dishonor your parents, that kind of thing. <clears throat> but, and I don't, so I'm thinking, well, maybe it doesn't re mean remember that there is a Sabbath day. Maybe it means remember to actually keep it. And if you think about it, probably everybody in here has forgotten what day of the week it was. Uh, like if you're on vacation or something. But Imagine you're in an agrarian society. You don't, there are probably plenty of weeks you don't have contact with anybody outside your regular area. There's no clocks, there's no calendars. You don't have paper, much less calendars. There are no, obviously, radios, internet, TV, or somebody can call and say, hey, <laughs> what day of the week is it? It would be very easy to lose track of the days of the week if you didn't actively do something to really make sure you kept up with what day of the week it was. So maybe when he said to remember that one, that's the only one he said to remember, it's a command for the other six days of the week that you have to actively keep up with. Anyway, that was my thought. Maybe that's what why he said that one to remember and none of the rest, because it's literally pretty easy to forget what day of the week it is if you're not keeping up with it. Uh, anyway, that's just a thought. <clears throat> so I want to uh, welcome our guests and uh, it makes it a little better for me because I'm partially recycling a message I gave uh, a few and a half years ago. So there's at least a couple more people that hadn't heard it at all. Uh, but anyway, you know, I was going through my notes and and I was, I just like this message. So I thought, you know, it wouldn't be bad to, to go back over this one. Well, the first part of it, it wasn't, but so anyway, my, I start with saying, is your faith ever tempted with the question, does God really exist? And I'll just go ahead and say, I am. Sometimes you just wonder. Uh, so I'm going to share a few thoughts that I use when, if that ever comes up, to try to think about when it happens to me and to prevent that from getting a foothold in there. Um, so, you know, for his own reasons, God is not currently revealing himself to us as explicitly as he has, you know, to the ancients in the Bible, as he's going to, there'll be no, no debating it one of these days. When you're resurrected and standing before him, shaking his hand or whatever, big hug, there's going to be no doubt. Uh, but, <clears throat> but even so, for example, Romans 1.20 says, For the, since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, that is, his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived, being understood by what he has made so that they are without excuse. In other words, you can tell that God's really there without actually talking to him, seeing him, touching him. <clears throat> and so to, one, to me, one of the most overwhelming things that, that he exists is that we exist, you know? And we had to get here somehow. And the most logical explanation is that there's a higher power that put us here. So most of the scientific world believes it in evolution, but it takes more faith to believe that statistical impossibility than it takes to believe there's another you know, explanation for it. 
And so, you know, they want to say it's almost a scientific fact. Well, it's really scientific faith to believe in that. And um, without going into it, how just ridiculous a bunch of random atoms can, can combine into something that can reproduce, eat, and all that stuff. And, and then, not only that, but then go from that to the billions of species we have on Earth. It is so mind boggling to think it could happen that way. But then you say, well, where did God come from? Well, okay, you don't know, but where did the stuff that the Big Bang came from? The, the, both theories have the same problem. We cannot comprehend, it, it's beyond our comprehension or to even guess how that could happen, really. I mean, I guess you could guess, but. Uh, so <clears throat> another type. So that gives me comfort just thinking about that. It's like, okay, how do we get here then? I, I, I am here, you know? So, but another type of convincing evidence, uh, now I say evidence, it's not proof, it's just evidence, um, is that sometimes things happen that are so amazing that rational and regular natural explanations just don't do it justice and yeah people can come up with these really strange almost like the a team you know they didn't get shot by the thousands of machine guns they're running across the field right well that's hollywood but if that happened in real life you'd start thinking okay god probably shielded those bullets well anyway a story like that <clears throat> that comes to mind is the true stories told in the movie hacksaw ridge um, and that's probably a lot of y'all seen that. I don't know. But it's the story of Desmond Doss, uh, who's a Seventh-day Adventist. And he was also a conscientious objector. So he would not carry a gun, but he did serve as a medic. He was, he wasn't, he was extremely brave and he wanted to serve his country. So he served as a medic. And um, the story is mostly around his life and then the uh the amazing thing that happened to him in a battle on one of the pacific islands where, where he the american forces had retreated but he went back but against orders i believe and he retrieved single-handedly 75 men and so he was one of the few conscience of objectors to ever receive the Medal of Honor, Congressional Medal of Honor. And it's just an inspiring movie. Uh, uh, but it's one of those things, if God wasn't with him, how could he have possibly done it? I mean, you could say it's coincidence, but that is getting into a huge coincidence. And when you add up all of these coincidences, you start thinking, well, maybe it's not a coincidence. But, okay, a little bit of a caveat, though. It is rated R for uh, war violence. So it's really not for everybody. I would, uh, actually it's a bit much for me, to tell you the truth. But I guess they were trying to be realistic and I doubt they could get anywhere close to realistic as horrible as war is, but I guess they were trying to get as close as they could. Uh, the one thing unrealistic about it is there wasn't hardly any bad language. And you know, <laughs> Those soldiers were letting a blue streak go. <laughs> You're getting your leg shot off and stuff. There was no calm language there. But so that part wasn't realistic. But uh, anyway, so those are only examples of evidence, you know, not actual proof. And <clears throat> well, I mean, it, I misread here evidence that there is a God. So what about evidence that Jesus? And the word of God are true. And um, so that to me, it's obvious you have to look to prof fulfill prophecy in the Old Testament. And uh, to me, so I'm going to look at some of that. And to me, the main, most compelling uh, argument is those that foretold Jesus' crucifixion. Because all of them, especially with the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, were done before that happened. 
absolutely no way it's even though it's 2000 years ago no one no no critic even says that those prophecies were written after the fact which that's what you do a lot of times like daniel's prophecies they say they were written after the fact um you can't say that about those it's impossible uh the the other thing is <laughs> his crucifixion is mostly agreed that it happened they agree that he was a man there's a few that say he didn't exist but the majority of even atheists accept that there was a man named jesus crucifixion was a common thing it wasn't that unusual that that story could happen it's not far-fetched at all um <clears throat> So one of the first things that come to my mind, and it's not as most explicit, but it's Passover. And, uh, and what makes it special to me is that everybody knew about Passover. I mean, they did it every year. It's been done. There's absolutely no question whatsoever that that was a thing. And then once you look at it after the facts, it's like, wow, that was just so much coincidence if it wasn't really foretelling that event. You know, the lamb not breaking his legs uh, is, is in particular detail that I find interesting. You know, that's in uh, Numbers 9, 12, and you say you must not break a bone of it. Mm -hmm. So in describing a, in, in mocking up a future capital punishment, a lot of them would involve getting a bone broken. Um, so, in fact, it was unusual that his legs weren't broken, and that's John 19.31. The, uh, so, John 19.31, it says, the Jew, and I guess I'm reading a uh, different version here. I don't have it what it is, but the Jew, Jewish leaders didn't want the victims hanging there the next day, which was the Sabbath, and a very special Sabbath at that, for it was the Passover. So they asked Pilate to order the legs of the men broken to hasten death, that their bodies would be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men crucified with Jesus. But then they came to him, saw that he was dead already, so they didn't break his. However, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and blood and water flowed out. <clears throat> and the soldiers did this to fulfill the scripture that says, not one of his bones shall be broken. And also the scripture, they shall look upon him whom they pierced. Um, so both of those were pretty specific, uh, fairly specific prophecies. And there's very little debate that they didn't actually happen. Now, of course, non-believers don't believe it was. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly what they're why they say maybe they say it's too uh, vague i don't know but so the pierced reference comes from zechariah 12 10 again proven to have occurred before christ's death and i will pour out on the house of david and the inhabitants of jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication then they will look on me whom they pierced yes they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son <clears throat> Okay, so when I think of King David, a prophet is not the first thing that comes to mind. He was, he's a lot of things, but he was also a prophet because many of the Psalms contain prophecies. And so in, in the famous uh, sermon on, uh, at Pentecost on, in Acts 2, Peter, talking of David, says in verse 25, so it's Acts 2, 25, for David said concerning him in 27, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. And so that's, he's quoting the Psalm there. And then, so Peter continues, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, who is both dead and buried. Therefore, being a prophet, Peter called him a prophet, and knowing that God has sworn with him an oath that the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, so a descendant of his, uh, would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. And he, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in the grave. 
nor did his flesh see corruption. So David prophesied a couple things, but one of those is that he wouldn't be in the grave very long. Short enough that his body would not start decay. And that's a specific prophecy, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years before the event took place. Um, so another prophecy of David is about the Passover day Jesus was crucified. <clears throat> so this is Psalm 22, Living Bible. But I am a worm, not a man, scorned and despised by my own people and by all mankind. Everyone who sees me mocks and sneers and shrugs and said, is this the one who rolled his burden on the Lord? They laugh. Is this the one who claims the Lord delights in him? We'll believe it when we see God rescue him. So that's what it said in Psalms, very close to what was recorded in the Gospels about the uh, crucifixion. And then and continuing in verse 12, I am surrounded by fearsome enemies, strong as the giant bulls. They come at me with open jaws, like lions attacking their prey. My strength has drained like water, and all my bones are out of joint. Which, if the way you're hanging, of course, it's an exaggeration, say all of them, probably. But the way you're hanging, a bunch of your bones are going to be out of joint. <clears throat> uh... My strength is dried up. My tongue is sticking to my mouth. He was thirsty. Uh, this, the enemy, this gang of evil men, circles me like a pack of dogs. They have pierced my hands and feet. He was nailed with his hands and feet. I can count every bone on my body. It said he was beat so bad that some of his bones were exposed. Again, I feel like exaggeration to say everyone. Um, See these men of evil gloat and stare. They divide my clothes among them with a toss of dice. Of course, that last one's so specific that critics say, okay, they just, the New Testament writers just added that one in there to, to cover that one. Uh, but a lot of those others, they don't say they just added in there. That, that describing the crucifixion. So to me, that's just remarkable. All that written back in the Psalms about what we know happened at a typical crucifixion. Now, the dividing of the clothes, maybe that wasn't typical. I don't know. Maybe it was. But, um, so, and this is another remarkable prophecy. <clears throat> um, so, so this, to me, describes his death pretty accurately. But another thing I found very remarkable, and I got this from, there's a website here if you want it, I can give it to you. But <clears throat> so it reports that the first historical record of a crucifixion was about 519 BC when Darius I of King of Persia crucified 3,000 political opponents. So David was describing a method of execution that was not something he's familiar with. It, they did stoning, they did other things, but the way he described it wouldn't describe any method that they had at the time. Uh, to me, that's really amazing. Um, so let me move on to Isaiah 53. So in Acts 8, starting verse 30, is where Philip runs up to the eunuch. He's reading Isaiah and, uh, you know, he wants him to explain it to him. And, you know, he's reading at the place of Isaiah 53, verse 7, where it says, He was led as a sheep before its shearers, silent. He didn't open his mouth. His humiliation, his justice was taken away. For his life was taken from the earth. And then the eunuch asked him, who's he talking about? And uh, Philip was explaining it to him. So let's go to Isaiah 53. And starting in verse 4. Again, Isaiah is part of the Dead Sea Scrolls, guaranteed to have been written before the facts. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, sorrows. Yet we esteem him stricken, stricken by God and afflicted, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. His stripes were healed. <clears throat> 
and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So this verse, uh, to add on to what David had said, you know, a lot of overlap there about describing something that sounds like a crucifixion, but that he was crucified with criminals, numbered with the transgressors. That's a pretty specific thing. It just seems amazing to me. Um, and then in verse 9, it says, His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death. So the Romans would have normally put a criminal like that in a criminal's grave. But we know Je uh, Jesus was put at the last second, this wasn't planned, according to the Gospels, in the rich man, Joseph of Arimathea, grave. So to me, that's amazing. It predicted that he would be in a rich man's grave back in Isaiah. And so skeptics, of course, will say coincidence or some of it's made up. But, you know, once you start piling up coincidences, it, it takes more faith to believe that they're a coincidence than that God planned it. <clears throat> So to me, those are some of the strongest evidence that God exists and that Jesus is his, uh, that Jesus is God. So, um, you know, even though I can't look at the uh, evidence totally unbiased, I believe that looking at it from a, a his purely historical standpoint, the by far most likely explanation is that the Bible's true. <clears throat> and so why isn't God revealing himself today uh, in a super clear way like he has? I have no idea, but I have faith that there is an actual and real reason, and it's for our benefit and good. <clears throat> but there is a lot of evidence to know he's there. And, uh, you know, I covered a couple today. Hopefully that will be a reminder and a comfort if if those thoughts ever ever try to get their way into your brain i know it's not absolute proof in a scientific sense and so it still takes faith to believe in god um but it's not blind faith you know it's, it's a faith based with evidence and uh and looking at all the evidence objectively which obviously i can't really be objective about it but I think the only logical conclusion is that there is a God and his word is true.